thank you for asking me to speak about exercise recommendations in athletes with uh, cardiomyopathy and channelopathy. Um, I also want to thank Sanjay Sharma in particular for some of his uh, information and a, a few images to say the least that really helped with this talk because he is the expert. Um, in terms of the diagnosis of these conditions in individuals, they will come from many different sources and we just need to be aware of that to begin with, whether they're from mandatory evaluation as part of a sports body's commitment to, to player health, or whether it's from voluntary charity-based uh, screening such as CRIES, or whether it's because of symptoms in the young individual, or whether it's detection due to being in a family history or having a family history of sudden death or uh, underlying inherited heart disease. And this will, to some extent, also alter um, how the person takes on board the recommendations that you're giving to them. Um, the importance is that uh, there is, from work done by Domenico's group, um, the ev uh, strong evidence that athletes appear to be at higher risk than non-athletes um, of um, sudden cardiac death. Uh, and therefore, it appears to be a potential trigger or mediator of risk. Uh, and the causes of sudden death in sport, you've already had alluded to before, but they uh, include the structural diseases, congenital and anatomical diseases, and cardiomyopathies as the majority, um, but also normal hearts, unexplained sudden deaths in up to a quarter, depending on the series that you look at. And from uh, SADS series that reflect unexplained sudden deaths, you will know that if you see families, you will identify iron channel diseases underlying these sudden deaths, and also sometimes cardiomyopathies as well, uh, with a yield of up to half, depending again on the series. And if you do molecular autopsy in these unexplained sudden deaths, you will find evidence for ge genetic evidence for long QT and Brigada syndrome and catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, giving a yield of up to 30%, again, depending on your series. So we there have a range of channelopathy um, and uh, cardiomyopathy where we wish to prevent sudden deaths. Um, and the exercise recommendations currently arise from two main documents, the ESC report in 2005 and the Bethesda Co Conference eligibility recommendations also from 2005, one being American, uh, the latter being American. There are some specific issues with athletes as well that Sanjay has already gone into great detail on, differentiating physiological adaptation from pathology uh, to ensure that you're actually managing the correct risk and also how to manage those who may have a genetic diagnosis of channelopathy or cardiomyopathy, but actually have very little to show in terms of the outward manifestation of the disease, the phenotype negative group. Uh, and you've already seen the ESC criteria, the uh, Seattle criteria in, in between, and the criteria just being shown to you by, uh, uh, by Michael. Um, I'm not wishing to blow the trumpet for you too much, Michael, there. Um, so, and, and it's quite straightforward when you have this 18-year-old athlete blacking out with exertion uh, who has this sort of ECG, the, the broad peak T waves, the uh, prolonged QT interval even when corrected using the Bazet's formula described by, by Michael as well. That's pretty straightforward and this fulfills very readily the long QT syndrome recommendations on diagnosis. Uh, the, Schw the Schwartz risk score being more than three and a half uh, it clearly is present in this individual, but you'll see as well we diagnose long QT in the presence of pathogenic mutations, in the presence of a QTC that's longer than 500 milliseconds, but in an asymptomatic individual on repeated ECGs, and in those who may have an intermediate value of uh, QTC, uh, but have arrhythmogenic syncope, so symptomatic individuals. How that um, is applied uh, with the Schwartz score here is going to be relevant to athletes in particular um, because athletes on those uh, scoring systems will have about a, a, a 1 in 250 risk of having long QT syndrome based on the QT interval alone. So we have to be very careful about ascribing um, long QT status and then making recommendations on an individual unless we're absolutely sure they have long QT syndrome. And I'm not going to go into that in detail because we've got the case study, so I've heard about how to approach that. Um, but certainly you would have seen already that the QT interval has been reclassified higher up uh, to be more certain about the diagnosis before assessing prognosis. But it does also raise the question, 
when you do see a moderate or uh, to uh, QT interval prolongation in the athlete, does that equate to higher risk if they carry long QT syndrome anyway? Are they at lower risk in general with the same QT interval as a non-athlete? And that's something that needs to be investigated further. The triggers for sudden death in long QT syndrome are related predominantly to adrenergic surge, and swimming is particularly important. Emotional, loud stimuli, fear, and sometimes stimulant drugs as well can be playing an important risk. But there are two different types of mechanisms of torsade de pointe. One is that adre and predominantly adrenergically associated, long QT1 subtype associated uh, um, torsade de pointe causing symptoms. Swimming is the main um, the predominant trigger there, but there's also the, the pause-dependent torsade de pointe, where you have uh, increasing, uh, increasingly lengthening pauses induced by ectopic activity, resulting in eventually a, 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 an episode. And this is associated with rest uh, and high vagal tone in particular, and we know that athletes tend to have higher vagal tone. Um, and across the different genetic subtypes of long QT syndrome, we have a, n a number of different settings for, for, um, or, or triggers for adverse events. But you'll see that exercise and emotion, even though they may be not as prominent as in the LQT1, are still important triggers in LQT2 and LQT3. Adrenergic surge is still important, um, and, and, and it should be minimized if possible that risk, and uh, we do also have to recognize that increased vagal tone in the athlete may increase risk at rest or asleep as well, and this is something that needs to be examined more closely uh, in the athletic population with long QT syndrome. But having said all that and scared the pants off athletes with long QT syndrome, we must also reflect on the fact that most um, adults with long QT syndrome do very well and are not at high risk from the condition. If you look at the event rates in females, it's 0.5% per annum of a life-threatening event. Uh, and if you look at males, it's, it's under one, well, it's about 1.1% per annum. So we're not looking at huge risks. We still have to differentiate those that are at the greatest risk, those already symptomatic, females, those with a greater QT interval, um, those are the, those who are at most, uh, 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 at most risk. And in terms of the therapy and the recommendations that we give, lifestyle and drugs are the mainstay in the majority of patients, and only a small number will need further intervention with device therapy or sympathectomy. Uh, so if we look at beta blockers in particular and how they will interact with the patient, we can see they're extremely beneficial, particularly in long QT1, but across the board in long QT syndrome. Uh, and beta blockers give a better prognosis independent also of the QT interval. Uh, the, the reasons for failure of, uh, um, of therapy is usually because of patients not taking their beta blockers or taking other QT prolonging drugs. So they're a mainstay of preventing sudden death in this group, and it does beg the question, can any athlete who we advise to, give, to have beta blockers, as I would do in most patients with long QT, um, can they perform on a beta blocker? And unfortunately, I think it, does, it is going to restrict many of these individuals anyway. And if you have a symptomatic patient, the current guidelines from Bethesda would say you're only allowed those class 1A sports that Sanjay mentioned earlier, and I'll elaborate to you in a second. While if you have long QT syndrome whatsoever, above 440 or 460, uh, the ESC guidelines will disqualify you completely from competitive sports. Uh, and this is the, uh, the, um, the range of um, um, different sporting uh, activities that may be considered. You'll see football at the bottom right with the increasing dynamic components being high. Um, on the right side of the x-axis, on the top side, left side, you'll see gymnastics being very high for the um, static component of exercise with boxing being a great, and rowing being a great example of combining both. You're certainly not allowed to do any of those. And you've, men, you've heard billiards, bowling, cricket, curling, golf, and riflery being included. Although I think cricket can get pretty aggressive between the, the, the wickets at time. And I, I think that might have been an American assessment of the risk of cricket. Um, I don't know about the risk of baseball. Anyway, um, what about the genotype positive, phenotype negative individuals? So without symptoms, you saw those Bethesda guidelines. Um, uh, they can participate in all sports except for swimming because it's thought to be a particular trigger, particularly in LQT1. But again, there is still advice on having beta blockers and there's advice about the availability of an AED in case. Um, and I think those beta blockers are still gonna be a compromise for most athletic individuals.
And in terms of the ESC guidelines, we've already heard they're pretty, pretty poor, but I understand from Sanjay that this is likely to change in future iterations of these guidelines. Of course, you have to continue to evaluate the individual, uh, and you must always be aware that um, if they're, they're phenotype negative, does that truly mean that they're phenotype negative? One resting ECG showing a normal to borderline QT interval doesn't necessarily mean they're phenotype negative. There is one proviso on all of this. There is a recent publication from um, uh, Mike Ackerman's group that actually managed to get published twice somehow. Um, but it's very interesting data because they've looked at a, a long QT population of 130 individuals who continued to participate um, in sport as athletes. Um, most of them genotyped as long QT patients, most of them on beta blockers, 20% uh, had an ICD. Um, and they were divided up into those who fulfilled Bethesda guidelines for participation, i.e. phenotype negative, and those who fell outside both ESC and Bethesda guidelines, the genotype positive and phenotype positive. And you can see their differences in QT intervals. And there was a reasonable five-year follow-up across the whole group, and there were zero uh, life-threatening events in the phenotype negative group, and there was only one individual who actually had two events um, in the uh, phenotype positive group. So actually, potentially a very pleasingly low risk profile in this population. And this may make us think about changing the, uh, uh, the advice in long QT syndrome in the future. But there's a big but about this. If you look at this study very closely, there were a small minority were in that top corner doing a lot of dynamic exercise, doing a lot of static exercise, or a combination of the two. Um, the follow-up is still relatively short when you've got a lifetime of athletic endeavor for 20, 30 years. And there were 3% there were, um, event rates per athlete year there, which is one event in 331 athlete years. And that actually gives you a massive confidence interval. One in 92 to one in 2,763. So how generalizable is that population? The event rate may be deceptively low because of the wide confidence interval. And you may, in fact, be dealing with something that's greater risk than you realize just looking at this one sample. And the Seattle criteria would have uh, maybe changed how you would have evaluated a lot of those individuals as to whether they actually truly had long QT or not, uh, particularly the genotype negative individuals in the study. So we have to take that with a lot of caution, I personally think, until if we're going to change criteria based on one study. The Brigada ECG. Is, um, uh, to is diagnosed on the basis of the type 1 pattern, the coved SC elevation with J-point elevation, T-wave inversion afterwards, seen in the right ventricular leads. Uh, and this can be in the high or the standard uh, lead positions, and the high ones, second or third intercostal spaces. And you have these type 2 and type 3 saddle-shaped patterns, and it's some, some uh, practitioners combine them into a single type 2 definition. And this seems to be potentially a partial form, but they also may also be a normal finding, as you've already heard from Michael. And we are diagnosed with Ashwellian provocation testing, and this is a sodium channel blocker test in the standard right ventricular leads, giving a very clear development of the type 1 Brigada ECG pattern in a, in a brother of a sudden death victim. And the consensus criteria currently advise and that Brigada syndrome is diagnosed if you see that spontaneously or after Ashmaline, or after a converting, or after any sodium channel blocker for that matter, or after con often converting a type 2 or type 3 pattern with a sodium channel blocker. Now, that um, differentiation of that Brigada pattern, which is a prevalence of 1 in 2,000 in the Western population and 1 in 500 in the Southeast Asian population, it can be important when you've seen those ECG changes that um, Michael spoke about. And this is another one where we just got to get that right. And if you look at the ST J point junction and the 80 millisecond ST junction here, this clearly demonstrates that the J junction is higher than the ST junction and the ratio between the two is uh, greater than one. And this is, a, this is a, a very straightforward way of trying to differentiate athletes in ECGs where the STJ junction will always tend to be lower than the actual ST80 millisecond junction, that convex pattern rather than the concave pattern. And this is a way to calculate it uh, to be uh, as certain as possible. So that ratio should be less than one. Um, and I think that's a relatively straightforward way of doing that. And if you look at all these early repolarization patterns in black athletes um, that were shown by Michael already, I think you'll see that the, uh, the actual J point and the 80 millisecond ST segments all seem to be um, uh, the, ST, the 80 millisecond always seems to be higher than the J point ST elevation.
other ways of differentiating, including the, I'll include the presence of a conduction abnormality, that you actually see a cl clear type 2 pattern with that, and potentially in a non-black athlete as well, and consider using those high leads, actually in provocation, and an MRI scan to help differentiating. And when it comes to sport, when you clearly think you have a type 1 Brigada pattern and have investigated it, uh, uh, then you have to think about what that risk is going to be. And there's very, very little data on this out there. Uh, and and uh, our concerns, however, are raised because we know that uh, athletes, as we said before, have high vagal tone and, and bradycardia, which are thought to be predisposing risks in Brigada syndrome, and they also can develop high body temperatures during endurance exercise, and that can also increase the risk from Brigada syndrome temporarily. And these may be potential triggers, but there is no evidence for it at all. There's no evidence base at all. But despite that, the ESC say no competitive sport at all, and Bethers to allow class 1A only. Um, I think Sanjay's recommendations, which I agree with, um, are that most sports are permitted, and I certainly don't restrict my Brigada syndrome patients, but I don't recommend um, uh, endurance activity or intensive uh, exercise in hot climates, and I agree with Sanjay's recommendations completely on that. So we're actually more liberal from that point of view because there is no evidence to support the risk in Brigada syndrome being excessively high. In terms of CPVT, it's a catecholaminergic syndrome. It's adrenaline-based. I think there's no argument here. The question comes, however, if you have a phenotype-negative individual uh, and a, and a, uh, a genotype-positive uh, a, a genotype phenotype-negative individual, might you let them do more? and some of my patients are doing more whatever I tell them. Um, and and that, may be a, uh, that may be an area where we could potentially allow a more uh, sporting activity. But overall, I think we do have to really limit those individuals. In terms of HCM, uh, the therapy in HCM uh, does involve lifestyle and drugs in particular, and we often know that beta blockers again are involved. And the, tr the uh, triggers for sudden death when it comes to exercise are going to relate to adrenergic surge dehydration, acid-base disturbance, and electrolyte imbalance that could all place the individual at risk of uh, life-threatening arrhythmia. And the same recommendations um, basically exclude um, all uh, symptomatic and phenotypically uh, uh, affected individuals from participating in competitive sports other than one A, according to the Defense of the Conference guidelines, which, uh, again, billiards, bowling, cricket, suck, curling, golf, and riflery. What about that genotype and um, phenotype uh, uh, interaction there? The uh, uh, risk of sudden death can it be uh, just as prevalent in the phenotype negative group. We've not really seen that risk in our patients in the clinic, but there is some evidence to suggest that there may still be underlying phenotype, particularly if you do sophisticated imaging studies in patients with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But if you look at long follow-up studies of young people, you don't necessarily see a, 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 um, a risk in the phenotype negative group uh, transpiring, but these are small number studies and they don't actually look at sports specifically. So I think we do have to uh, still have some concern about this um, genotype phenotype negative group until we know more. But if there's no symptom, no family history of sudden death from HCM, then the Bethesda guidelines do permit participation in sports while the ESC guidelines will only allow for recreational competitive, non-competitive sports. So there is clearly a discrepancy there in how both societies have viewed, viewed it traditionally. Again, annual evaluation is extremely important in these individuals. It is likely to change according to Sanjay's advice. And moving on to ARVC, finally. Um, exercise and ARVC seem to be intimately intertwined. The ARVC... Um, uh, pathogenic mechanism appears to be related to dysfunction of desmosomal connections and physical connections between myocytes at the end plates between heart cells, and that you have disruption of these apoptosis and replacement with um, fibrosis uh, and, and fatty tissue. And therefore, you do wonder if you put your heart in, under greater strain, will there be greater risk? And we did touch on that earlier in relation to left ventricular cardiomyopathy. And indeed, Mice models of ARVC have suggested that those that are forced to exercise do less well. Um, and in fact, patients do so as well, according to observational studies conducted um, in the States and elsewhere with a lower age of presentation, a higher risk of VT, and earlier heart failure in those who undertake uh, endurance exercise. Um, 
So the guidelines do clearly limit the uh, individuals with overt symptomatic forms of ARVC uh, uh, completely. But if there are no symptoms or no risk factors for sudden death, so the, the, the potential phenotype negative, genotype positive group, the Bethesda guidelines will allow class 1A sports, while the ESC guidelines um, are still restrictive. We do worry in the end that we may be uh, allowing the phenotype to engender with time. Of course, again, annual evaluation is extremely important. And once we've consigned our patients to recreational exercise only, then I think there is some, you do still have to make some recommendations. So um, sports permitted in most asymptomatic individuals with inherited heart disease, according to that circulation document, are in that list. So you can uh, get to do more than just cricket, uh, if you like. Uh, but golfing is still included there as a leisure activity rather than, a comp uh, and, and rather than necessarily a competitive sport. Actually, it's in both, isn't it? Well, there we go. Um, and swimming is in there still as a leisure activity. But we avoid sudden explosive sports uh, or activities, uh, excessively high heart rates. We ask patients to monitor their heart rates and make sure they don't go above 80% of the maximum predicted and avoid extreme circumstances for exercise and intensive programs for exercise. And in the symptomatic patient, I think you have to tailor your, your, uh, um, your uh, advice appropriately. Uh, the, the, the more symptomatic, the more limited the risk for sudden death is going to be higher, and, and you have to tailor your advice to them uh, appropriately. So in conclusion, competitive sport involving medium-high intensity is prohibited in most cardiomyopathy and iron channelopathy patients. Uh, this may change, at least for long QT and Brigada syndromes, from some of the evidence that we've seen or the lack of evidence for, for risk. But there are still discrepancies between current US and European guidelines, which will hopefully be resolved in the future, particularly when we're looking at genotype uh, positive, phenotype negative individuals uh, in a pre-symptomatic stage. Uh, and recreational exercise should still be encouraged because in the end, we do have other cardiovascular risks other than inherited cardiac disorders, uh, which I think you will hear about from the subsequent speaker. Thank you for your attention.